good morning to you. Well, um, can you hear me? Everyone hear me okay? Yeah, I can really lean in the back. All right. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to the book of Hosea. I want to invite you all to a little series I hope to continue called The Lesser Known Council of John. The idea is to go through some of the books that are not preached from as much as others. For every book in the canon of Scripture is worthy. Every word is God breathed, and God's word will not return void. I just want to make a quick comment on what Mike said this morning. Now, this is written down like this off script. Mike asked me if Mom looked over my message. I said, Of course she has. She's been doing that since the very first time I spoke. I don't know how many years ago it was. I remember it was on 1 Corinthians chapter 5, a particularly difficult passage, talking about a man having relations with his father's wife. That was my first time in speaking. <laughs> she helped me tremendously, and she still has. And just, you know, just a word that, you know, why the Bible it just shows men being leaders uh, in charge of home, in charge of the church and whatnot. I would say, mothers, you have no idea the influence you have on your sons. Even into a book. It is tremendous. The old phrase, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world, that's not quite what I'm bringing in here, but it's, it's very true. The influence is tremendous that you have on your sons. Okay, before we start reading, a little background information on the prophet and the time period. There's actually very little known about the prophet Isaiah, whose name means salvation. We don't know at what age he started his ministry. We don't know what city he's from. We don't even know the tribe he belonged to. Uh, the early church father uh, thought he belonged to the tribe of Issachar, but we really don't know for sure. I would say, however, that he was probably from the northern kingdom, because in chapter 7, he refers to the king of the north as our king. We know the name of his father. It's Beery. It means a wellspring. And we can see some imagery of God the Father and God the Son in their two names. Isaiah chapter 12, verses 2 and 3 says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and song. He also has become my salvation. Therefore, with joy, we will draw waters from the wells of salvation. And on that day, you will say, Praise the Lord. Hosea prophesied during the reigns of King Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, and that made him contemporaries with the other prophets, Amos, Isaiah, Jonah, and Micah. That also shows that Hosea prophesied during the last days of the kingdom of Israel. Lastly, the theme of the book of Hosea is unfailing love. However, that is the theme of the entire Bible. So, if I was to be more specific, I would say the theme is the rejection of Israel, the consequences for Israel, and then mercy given to Israel. Last, oh sorry, uh, verse 1. Let's go start reading here um, uh, the word of the Lord. Chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, the son of Beri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, the king of Israel. So Hosea mentions all the kings that reigned in Judah during his ministry, but he only lists one king in Israel of the six that reigned during his ministry in the north. And some commentators believe that is because Jeroboam was the last king of Israel directly ordained by God. When Jehu was appointed to the throne, and because he had done, quote, all that the Lord had commanded him to do, God blessed Jehu and said, you and your sons will be on the throne till the fourth generation. And Jeroboam was that fourth generation. And Jeroboam's son, who was assassinated while the after Jeroboam, there was just uncertainty as to how long a king would be on the throne and who would take it up next by whatever underhanded means. Verse 2, when the Lord began to speak by Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry, for the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. God says in chapter 12, verse 10 of this book of Hosea, that he will sometimes speak with similitudes in the prophets. And what is a similitude? Most of us can guess it is something that is similar to something else. And while God mostly uses words for his similitudes in comparing one thing to another, sometimes he asks his prophets to be living examples of those similitudes. 
He told the prophet Jeremiah, you're not going to marry. He told the prophet Ezekiel, your wife is going to die, and you will not mourn for her when she does. And now he's telling Hosea, you're going to marry someone that is going to be unfaithful to you. In saying take a wife of harlotry, God could be telling Hosea, straight out, find a prostitute to marry. Or he could be speaking prophetically to Hosea by saying the woman you will marry will become unfaithful to you. I prefer that interpretation because I believe the analogy fits better of a, a wife who was faithful at first, just like Abraham was faithful at first, and later the wife becomes unfaithful, just as now Israel has rejected God. All that being said, I will admit that the first interpretation to find a woman who was a prostitute is a little bit better reading than the Hebrew. God tells Hosea why he's going to do this. God has said that the land has committed harlotry. God is not being literal here. Uh, the 20th century economist Milton Friedman, I hope anyone's ever heard of him before, yep. but he was, he gave a lot of tours, a lot of speaking, Mike Shakespeare. Yeah. I really like the guy. He's a yeah. guy smart. He always had a Q&A after all of his speeches. <laughs> and one time a person asked him if it would be beneficial for businesses to pay higher taxes. And he responded by saying, businesses don't pay taxes. This building owner doesn't pay any taxes. People pay taxes. And that's what God is saying here when he says that the land has committed harlotry. He's saying the people that live in my land have rejected me and chose someone else. Now God is going to use Hosea's wife as an example of how Israel has rejected God and search for others. But more importantly, God is going to use Hosea as an example of himself. How he loves his people and desires them back unto himself. Verse 3 now. So he went and took Gomer, which means completed, the daughter of the blame, which means two kings. And she conceived and bore him a son. If you haven't noticed by now, names in the Bible are absolutely fascinating. Whenever I see a name in the Bible, I, I generally go look up to see what it means. Names back then were, were more often given at the time of birth and not before, like we do today. I remember before Lily was born, or even before Trisha was pregnant with Lily. Uh, she bought this book that said 10,001 Baby Names. Mm -hmm. Omar came, I don't know if you bought those books recently, recently, but back then it was usually given at a time of birth. We see the birth of Jacob. And what does he do? He grabs onto his brother's foot on the way out. And they call him Yaoka, a uh, heel catcher. Uh, we see Rachel giving birth and dying on his birth. And so she names her son Ben Oe, uh, ben which means son of my sorrow. But Jacob wasn't going to call him that for the rest of his life, so he, he named him Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. I think we can all guess who the son of his left hand was. There was no secret there. I can see how Gomer possibly got her name. Gomer means completed, but more specifically, it means to come to an end. So Gomer's mother gives birth, and she says, you know, that's it. We're done here. Last child is Gomer. Uh, I couldn't even fathom a guess how the blame got his or her name, which means two cakes. Let's just imagine the scene where a mother gives birth and she's looking around the room for something to name her child and she sees a couple of fig cakes on the table. Why am I talking about names so much? <laughs> well, it's because the rest of this chapter, and I would say even the rest of this book, deals with the names of Gomer's children and how God is going to use their names as a similitude for what is about to happen to Israel. Let's look at the first name. Verse 4. Then the Lord said to him, call his name Jezreel. For in a little while I will avenge the bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of Jacob, and bring an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. It shall come to pass in that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. The name Jezreel means God will so. And that makes sense for what is said right after, for in a little while. So God is not going to bring destruction on Israel today, but he's going to sow the seeds of destruction, which will he will reap at a later time. The name Jezreel also has a double meaning here in that it was the name of a city in the northern kingdom of Israel. It's actually an important city. It's where a lot of the northern kings would have their palaces. So it's quite a, a fancy place with big homes and whatnot. It was also a place where Jehu committed just unspeakable acts of murder. The Bible records in 2 Kings chapter 9 that Elisha went and anointed Jehu to be king over Israel. And he also told Jehu, you are to wipe out the line of Ahab. 
All males born from Ahab, both bond or free, that is, born from a concubine or are born from a wife. And Jehu does just that. In fact, the Lord commends him for doing, quote, what was right in my eyes. That's the Lord speaking. He did what was right in my eyes. So, why there uh, then is vengeance coming upon the house of Jehu for the bloodshed? I believe it's because Jehu went far beyond what the Lord had told him to do. God told Jehu to wipe out the line of Ahab, and he did that. However, Jehu went on a killing spree that day. In addition to killing King Joram of Israel, which he was commanded to do, he also killed Ahaziah, which was the king of Judah at that time, who just was visiting King Joram that day. He then killed all of Ahab's friends, all of his servants, all of his advisors, and his personal priests. Jehu then leaves the city and sees a, a group of people traveling uh, towards the city. He says, hey, who are you guys? And they said, oh, we're relatives of King Ahaziah. We've come to visit. Jehu says, aha, kill him. And he kills all 42 of those relatives and throws their bodies into a pit. He then goes inside the city again and kills all the prophets of Baal by means of deception. He says, you think King Joram was a big worshiper of Baal? No, you watch me. So he gets all the prophets of Baal and he kills them all uh, in their place of worship. I know what you might be thinking, Matt, the prophets of Baal, they should have been killed just like in the time of Elijah. But that really misses the point of what God commanded Jehu to do on that day. When all was said and done, God blesses Jehu for doing, again, this is God speaking, what was right in my eyes, doing so to the house of Ahab. Period. God never commanded, nor did he ever commit. Jehu for killing King Ahaziah, all of King Ahaziah's relatives, all the friends, advisors, and so on and so forth. In the same way, though, that water still came out of the rock when Moses struck it for the second time, God's purposes will not fail regardless of how the vessel acts. God's purpose was to have the line of Ahab destroyed, and it was done. But Jehu and his bloodlust went far beyond the Lord's command in order to secure his throne. Jehu did not trust the appointment of the Lord. He trusted in the edge of his sword. This was the bloodshed that God will avenge, and in doing so, bring an end to the kingdom of Israel. Um, oh, excuse me, to the, to the kingdom of Israel. Verse 6. She conceived again and bore a daughter. Then God said to him, Call her name Loruhah, for I will no longer have mercy on the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. Yet I will have mercy on the house of Judah, I will save them by the Lord their God, and will not save them by bow, nor by sword or battle, by horses or horses. In the Hebrew language, the word lo, it means no or not. And when you see it in front of another word, generally you are to take the opposite of what that word means. Now we have a similar conjunction here in the English language with the letter A in some of our words. We know that the word theist, it means someone who believes in God, and the word atheist is someone who does not believe in God. Another word is uh, muse. It means to think. It means to ponder. When you put an A in front of it, ah, muse. And while it does literally mean not to think, we use it in such a way that we're having so much fun that we are not thinking. So when you go to an amusement park, you can realize that it is aptly named because we don't go to Disneyland or to Knott's Berry Farm to think. We go to have fun and have a good time. No ruhama. No mercy. What a sad state for anybody to find themselves in, where God has finally said, that's it, no more mercy for you. God said that his spirit will not always strive with men. And sometimes God says, okay, that's too much. You've gone too far. You are not responding to the mercy that I am showing you. So the time for consequences has come. In a similar way, God told Jeremiah, this is after the time of Hosea, he told Jeremiah, don't pray for these people. And now God is speaking about the kingdom of Judah. Don't pray for these people, nor let them a cry or prayer for them, nor make an obsession to me, for I will not hear it. God told Jeremiah that he was going to make a desolate the land of Judah, just as he did the whole prosperity of Ephraim. And Jeremiah didn't want to see that happen to his people, but lo was upon them, just as it was Israel before them. Is there a similar thing in the new covenant we have with God? I would say yes, there is a similar line that we can cross where Paul says that we should be handed over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. 
a time where mercy has run its course and found not to have an impact on the believer. And then that way a more drastic step must be taken so that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Even in times like those, it is not wholly 100% like Lord Luhamon because it is for God's mercy that he allows the destruction of our flesh to happen and not the destruction of our soul. Returning to Gomer, verse 8. When she had leaned Loruhamah, she conceived and bore a son. Then God said, Call his name Loami, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. We have another low before us, and the word that is attached to is people. And make no mistake, this is not God forsaking his covenant that he made with the people of Israel. This is God recognizing the choice the people of Israel have made. They have chosen not to be his people. They have chosen to reject Jehovah as their God, and God is accepting their decision. We're going with the idea of God rejecting his people. Because of the covenant that God made with Abraham, God would never completely destroy the Israelites. Whether it was his proclamation to Moses in the desert, Moses, I am tired of these people. I'm going to wipe them all out. I'm going to start over with you. I'm going to make a great nation out of you. That still would have been in line with the covenant he made to Abraham because Moses was a descendant of Abraham. We remember Elijah after he had his victory at Mount Carmel. He runs away and tells God, oh, God, it's just me. I'm your last guy. After I'm gone, it's over. But God tells Elijah, no, 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 there are 7,000 that have not bowed the knee to Baal in all of Israel. Lastly, Mordecai tells Esther, if you don't go before the king, what does he say? Salvation will come from somewhere else. God's purpose and promises will not be thwarted by man's decision to reject him. So when God is saying to the Israelites, you are not my people, he is not talking to all descendants of Abraham in perpetuity. He is talking to this group of Israelites right here, right now. And we know this because the next verse tells us of God's future plan for his covenant people. Verse 10, yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people. Then it shall be said to them, You are the sons of the living God. Then the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together and appoint for themselves one head. And they shall come up out of the land. Their great will be the day of Israel. Jezreel, excuse me. What a glorious promise. What unfailing love does the Lord have for his people? For he's saying this in the middle of their, their horribleness, in the middle of their evil, in the middle of their idolatry. And even before destruction comes upon them, God shows the future of his people coming back again. Not just being the sons of Abraham, but being the sons of God. So let's sum up the names of Gomer's children. We have Jezreel, which means God will sow. And what is God going to sow? Destruction. Destruction will come upon Israel. No ruha, no mercy. There will be no mercy in your destruction. It will be complete. The land will be taken from you. And lo, Ami, you are not my people, and I will not be your God from now and into your exile. But let's look again at the promise in verse 11. The children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together and appoint for themselves one head. God is telling them that there will be a time when Israel and Judah are joined together again. Not the two, not the split kingdom that they are currently in. Some commentators believe that this was built when Judah came back from exile. Some believe this happened in the 1940s when Israel became a nation state again. If I had to choose, I would pick the 1948 return because the return from exile was really just a thing of Judah. Uh, in fact, they denied help from the northern tribes and the rebuilding of Jerusalem, the rebuilding of the temple, because they said they had mixed blood. The, the northern ten tribes intermarried with the Assyrians and they intermarried with the surrounding nations. So the tribe of Judah, when they came back from exile, says, no, we don't want you here. There was also not one head of state over all 12 tribes at the time. Now, in favor of the 1948 return, uh, nobody knew what tribe they were from, really. I mean, some think they knew, but the records were lost or destroyed over the centuries. So really, it was just the sons of Abraham coming together and making for themselves a nation state and appointing one head over all of them in the form of a prime minister. Both interpretations have merit. It's just really important to not be dogmatic about it, 
just enough to realize that God fulfills his word. Chapter 2, God continues, Say to your brother, my people and to your sisters, mercy is shown. Verse 1 here, it's really connected to verses 10 and 11 from the previous chapter. A day where the nation of Israel is united and they can say to one another, we are God's people. And mercy has been shown to us. In the Hebrew text, chapter 2 actually begins with verse 10 of chapter 1. Show uh, serves as a reminder that the chapter breaks and the verses are completely man-made. Uh, added way after the kind of the scripture was put together. Not for nefarious purposes. They actually are extremely helpful in locating scripture and the reading of scripture. But sometimes the chapter breaks are just put in horrendous places. We, we have this thought when we read a book and the chapter has ended, well, then the thought has ended. You know, a new thought will begin in chapter 2, shall we say. And we can bring that idea into reading the scripture. When really many times the thought from the first chapter flows into the beginning of the next chapter. Verse 2 is where the new thought begins. With the description of what will happen to wayward Israel and the analogy of an adulterous wife and her offspring. Bring charges against her mother, bring charges. For she is not my wife, nor am I her husband. Let her put away her harlotries from her sight, and her adulteries from between her breasts, lest I strip her naked and expose her as in the day she was born, and make her like a wilderness, and set her like a dry land, and slay her with thirst. This is a call out to any of the faithful that remain in Israel to try and bring back the nation from idolatry. Telling them what would happen to the nation if they kept going on its current path. God said he's going to make the land desolate. He's going to kill all the inhabitants. And we know who God is going to use for this task. The nation of Assyria. Verse 4, I will not have mercy on her children, for they are the children of harlotry. Now, understand that the adulterous wife, mother uh, character, as well as her children, both represent the people in Israel. God is describing a generational spiral into idolatry. As one generation would worship Baal or some other false god, so they would teach their children to do the same thing, making them not the children of Jehovah, but the children of idolatry. And in that way, they will face the same consequences and receive no mercy. Verse 5, For their mother has played the harlot. She who conceived them has behaved shamefully. For she said, I will go after my mothers, who give me my bread, my water, my wool, my linen, my oil, and my drink. And this is a, actually a very apt similitude uh, of this adulterous wife because prostitutes would seduce men in order to receive things from them, uh, whether it be food or goods or money. In the same way, the people of Israel would worship false gods in order to receive things from them. They would worship this God for a good rain, this God for a good harvest, and perhaps another God for protection in battle. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up your way with thorns and wall her in, so she cannot find her paths. God is saying he's going to stop the increase. He's going to stop the bread and the water, the wool and the linen, the oil and drink. And just as he put an angel to guard the entrance to the Garden of Eden, so now he's going to put a hedge of thorns between the people of Israel and prosperity and direction, so that they may be lost and not know what to do. Verse 7, she will chase her lovers but not overtake them. Yes, she will seek them, but not find them. Then she shall say, I will go to return to my first husband. For then it was better for me than now. Now this is just seen day in and day out. Most people who do not have a relationship with the Lord. They chase, but do not overtake. They seek, and yet they do not find. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead. But mankind has exchanged that truth for a lie. And now they have this hole in their existence that only God can fill, and yet they're going to try everything else under the sun to satisfy that. But it can never be done. They will always chase, but never overtake. They will always seek, but never find, because only in God will you ever be fully satisfied. Now, when the adulterous woman says, you know, uh, I'm going to go back to my first husband, it can kind of bring to mind the parable of the prodigal son. Uh, we see the son in a distant land, tending to pigs, eating the food that is given to the pigs, and he has an epiphany. Even the servants in my father's household are treated better than this. 
But the adulterous wife is really acting nothing like the prodigal son. But the son of the parable thinks to himself, I am not worthy to be my father's son anymore. I will ask him to be the servant. The son was willing to lower himself in the form of a servant as a sign of remorse, just for a chance to be accepted again by his father. The woman here, seeing that she just no longer receives the bread and the water and the oil and the linen, says to herself, I'm, I'm going to go back to my first husband. Maybe I can get those things from him. No period of remorse, no realizing what she has done uh, as something is wrong. She just thinks she deserves it, whoever she is with. And in the similitude for Israel here, this is just the Israelites praying to Baal or praying to Ashtaroth for certain things and not receiving them and saying to themselves, you know what, let's, let's give Jehovah a chance. Let's see if we can get those things from him like we did before. No repentance, no hearts being turned, just selfish desires being exposed. Verse 8, for she did not know that I gave her grain, new wine and oil, and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. All the blessings that the Israelites received in actuality came from God and not the false God they were praying to. Even in times of disobedience, God can be gracious. Amen. It is a very dangerous thing to think when we are being disobedient to the Lord, if we are walking in a wayward path, that if we receive good things in life, that God is indifferent to what we are doing, or even worse, that God is being permissible of what we are doing. We must not mistake the grace and mercy of God for indifference, lest we end up in a similar situation as Israel is about to be. Let's read verses 9 through 13 here. Therefore I will return and take away my grain and in its time, my new wine in its season, and will take back my wool and my linen, given to cover her nakedness. Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one shall deliver her from my hand. I will also cause all her mirth to see, uh, cease, her feast days, her new moons, her Sabbaths, all her appointed feasts. And I will destroy her vines and her fig trees, of which she has said, These are my wages that my lover has given to me. So I will make them a forest, and her beasts of the field shall eat them. I will punish her for the days of the bowels to which she burned incense. She decked herself with earrings and jewelry and went after her lovers, but me she forgot, says the Lord. So the punishment has been announced, and now God is going to give a promise. Therefore, behold, I will allure her, will bring her to the wilderness and speak comfort to her. Why a wilderness? I thought to myself when I first read this. Well, it's reminiscent of the first wilderness that the, uh, the, 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 the Israelites went through on their exodus from Egypt. That wilderness was a time of judgment, but it was also a time of provision, of cleansing, and preparation. I will give her her vineyards from there, and the valley of Achor as a door for her. She saw sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up from the land of Egypt. And it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that you will call me my husband, and no longer call me my master. God is saying during this time of judgment, he's going to be a master. Not going to be gentle. He's going to be a taskmaster. It will no longer be a familiar relationship, but one of an owner. However, there's a coming day. God is promising the return to the blessed covenant that He made with them in the first wilderness. The whole point of judgment was to prepare them, to cleanse them for a restored relationship with Himself. Verse 17: I will take from her, uh, I will take from her mouth the names of Baal, and they shall be remembered. By their name, no more. Now, that's an interesting thing to note, not necessarily direct correlation to this verse, but since their return from Babylon, they have never chosen another God besides Jehovah. I understand certain Jews and certain groups of Jews might make their individual decisions, but as a whole, the sons of Abraham, the central figure in their lives, have been Jehovah since then, just as if the names of Baal had been taken from their mouths. Let us finish up to the end of the chapter here. In that day I will make a covenant with them, with the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the creeping things of the ground. Bow and sword of battle I will shatter from the earth to make them lie down in safety. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice, uh, justice, in loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. 
And it shall come to pass in that day that I will answer, says the Lord, I will answer the heavens, and they shall answer the earth. The earth shall answer with grain, with new wine, with oil. They shall answer Jezreel. Then I will sow her for myself in the earth, and I will have mercy on her who have not obtained mercy. Then I will say to those who are not my people, you are my people. And they shall say, you are my people. Just some beautiful promises made by God to his people. Some fulfilled in the years soon after writing this prophecy, and some still yet to be fulfilled at a later date. There is an ingrained thought to look at verse 23 and think that Hosea is talking about the future Gentile church. But this prophecy was written about Israel. And verse 23 is a direct correlation to the names of Gomer's children. Jezreel, God will sow destruction. But now God is saying, I'm going to sow Israel back to myself. Lo Ruhama, no mercy in your destruction. But now God says, you will obtain mercy again. You are not my people, Lo Ami. But when this time comes, you will be my people. And you're going to say, you are our God. I really understand the inclination to correlate verse 23 with the Gentile church because Peter uses it in his epistle. Um, but Peter was using that verse as an analogy. He was in no way claiming verse 23 was written with the Gentile church in mind. Now that's where we're going to end today. Just a snapshot in time of an adulterous nation uh, and God's plan for punishment and restoration. Now Moses predicted that this was going to happen to the people of Israel. Near the end of his life, he was talking to the Israelites, and he was telling them about the blessings that would follow their obedience and the cursings that would follow their disobedience. And he says near the end of what he was saying, It shall come to pass when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse, which I have set before you. And you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God drives you, and you return to the Lord your God and obey his voice, according to all that I command you today, you and your children with all your heart and with all your soul, that the Lord your God will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you and gather you again from the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts from under heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you. Then the Lord your God will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. And he will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. This is exactly what the Lord is telling the Israelites through the prophet Hosea. Just what Moses predicted would happen centuries before it did. So today we've read of God's grace, his justice, his mercy, and his unfailing love. You know, the patience that God has shown to the nation of Israel uh, before enacting his judgment. That was rightly due to them long before this. If you were to read the books, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles, you would know what I'm talking about. The foolishness of the ungodly to say that God is cruel, that God is evil, and they don't know the first thing about his mercies and his patience and his plan. We have the blessing of knowing that as God was then, he is now. He never changes. We can count on his grace and mercy in our lives and rely on the discipline that is corrective, but also loving and restorative. Psalms 48 and 14 says, for this is our God, our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even to death. May the God of all peace, joy, and comfort be with you this week. May you just have a special and unique encounter with our Lord. And may we all have a moment where we just fully understand, not just with our intellect, but with our heart and with our soul, that the God of all creation loves us with an unfailing love. Let's close in prayer and pray for the food we are about to receive. Our gracious Lord, we just love you so much. Your mercy, your grace, it is unending. And we just stand in awe of it, Lord. Bless us as we go out from this meeting here. Bless the food to the body, our bodies which we are about to partake in. Let us be a light for you as we go out into the world. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.